So a quick overview here of the coastal setting here of Cairns. So we're looking this way is to the north, basically. This way down here is to the south. And um, the story of this, uh, the, the brief story of this coastal setting is that this is a very transformed shoreline as most of our shorelines have been across the planet. When we first glance at this, we'll see this very developed, very developed um, uh, coastal fronting area uh, on the immediate coastal fringe here, a uh, small vegetation patch, and then an area called the Esplanade that um, runs uh, between the uh, uh, buildings in the water. Uh, and then you'll see, you can see it right here, very shallow. And a lot of this, there's, there's a lot of uh, shallowing on this stretch of the coast um, tied in. And you can see it, maybe a little bit hard to see, but if we, if we look in over this way, you can see lots of mangrove uh, fronting the um, coastline. And so this area is very shallow. So if we, if we go straight out, we're gonna hit the Great Barrier Reef, the southern extent of the Great Barrier Reef. Um, so uh, people, that, people have been living here for many, many thousands of years. Uh, Aboriginal folks argue up to 40,000 years or more um, direct I, th I think there's direct archaeological evidence for at least you know four to five thousand years of clear continued uh, human presence um, the first recorded uh, uh, European documentation of what was going on here um, really uh, comes to us uh, from um, uh, Cook in 1770 uh, but that he notes and we know by that point um, there had been these thousands of years of the uh, Yadni speaking Aboriginal people that were all around here. And this was a very popular uh, a settlement. So there's um, uh, several rivers around us. There's the Barren River up behind over here. And then over here to the right, there's the mouth of the much, uh, much larger Trinity River. Um, Cook, who is uh, many things, but um, included amongst them um, a master navigator, uh, figured out uh, how to navigate. So if we go from here on out into the sea, lots of shoals, um, lots of uh, you know, uh, coral reefs and, and hard to navigate in. He came in through it. Um, they eventually would name the Trinity Channel and this, this whole area is Trinity Bay. And this is going from uh, Cape Grafton over there, the southern point you see up uh, and then way up the coast here uh, uh, beyond where we can see the top of this this embayment, this Trinity Trinity Bay, um, and uh, when he came in, he noted, and then what would ha go on to happen, uh, and later with uh, more detailed um, surveys, uh, coastal surveys for navigation, and starting in 1819, and then um, uh, the first detailed uh, bathymetric study of this area, 1848, um, all shows this is you know very shallow area. Um, a lot of shoals, challenging navigation. So um, uh, this area, uh, and, and then all those, all those uh, European documentation note the extensive number of Aboriginal settlements, lots of water sources because of the fresh water, et cetera. There's wells, uh, springs, and things of that nature around. So very um, a desirous place to uh, stand, uh, to, to, to live and, and work and do all that kind of stuff. Um, the next thing that comes along is in 1866 in a Sydney newspaper, a guy writes uh, an essay about S.V. Mean, I guess his name, a captain, um, about uh, sea cucumbers. So the sea cucumbers that are all over the place and that are very uh, popularly eaten directly or sometimes just the in intestines eaten um, uh, and, then, and then put back on the reef, but regardless, uh, sea cucumbers, very popular uh, food supply in reef uh, dwelling communities and, and people that live in and around tropical areas. So he writes this essay in Sydney, he says, oh, this is great fishing. So that, that induces a bunch of European settlers to come to this area um, in the immediate wake of that 1866 story and start to settle. So the, so the first real, I mean, other than sort of initial people blowing through, the first real extended contact is with um, European fishermen here to exploit the biological resources of this coastal zone. That goes on for uh, a, a few years, I guess, vaguely okay, at least in the sense that there's nothing declared. 
Um, and then there's a big, um, a big fight in 1872 over water, and that that causes everything you would think would start to happen in these situations. Um, let's see if we can turn this down. Let's not, not flared out. Um, so then, uh, let's see, okay, so there we go. So then next uh, is, where was I? I was talking about the fishermen. Um, and then, very similar to sort of our California story, then in 1870, uh, also 1872, um, a prospector, this guy named Hand, goes up the Palmer River south of us and uh, finds gold. And that sparks another gold rush starting in 1873, just like the 49ers in California. A um, lot of people didn't know the area, didn't know the land, didn't know um, you know anything about the, the local peoples, just started blasting on in and all the uh, troubles we can imagine with that. This, uh, a lot of people, as we know from coastal exploitation and resource exploitation, generally speaking, most of the folks that come into these rush situations, um, they don't make money, right? The people make the money or making the money off the people coming in for the most part. And so that happened, and so many people come here, they don't get good um, results from their prospecting, so they leave. And a lot of these are, 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 are immigrants from other countries, so uh, China, uh, Italy, uh, places like that. They come back from, and the gold is inland, so they come back from, you know, a couple hundred kilometers. So they come back from the gold fields and settle in and around this area and start doing lots of ag. And so that's start to see extensive sugar cane and other crops going in and so we have the gold we have the sugar crops there's increasing demand for connectivity here in northern queensland with the rest of the country and the world so then the the stuff uh the, the efforts start going in in earnest about improving connections so first a rail line has begun to lay down and then talk of expanding the port facilities so we can have more um, commerce and shipping and all this and that so that eventually, um, so the formal establishment of what we now call the city of Cairns starts in 1876. And then um, the, the town is, is or the settlement's established in 1876 by the government. And then the town is formally incorporated in 1903. And right after that, 1906, the Harbor District is established. And so they immediately get to work on how to deal with shipping and all this kind of stuff. So this leads to lots more dredging. And so dredging of the channels out here, dredging of the sort of coastal strand um, in and around this area. And back in the day, dredging meant dig it up and just dump it. And so that leads to a huge sedimentation. So there's this flat that we see right here, this the shallows right here. Um, hard to know exactly, but from historic pictures, it, it sounds like from what I've been uh, talking to folks and, and, and inspecting around, um, that there were, um, there. okay, so by definition, we have the, these river mouths around, so we have a lot of set, sediment coming in. So this is always gonna be a sediment-rich place, a muddy place, so a lot of silts uh, deposited right on the shoreline or near to the shoreline. Um, and so mangroves always a part, but we also had more extensive beaches, particularly in this, around this area, it sounds like, sandy beaches, but that was what I mean, should have said, sand, sand beaches. Um, but this dredging that's, that is going on to support the commerce leads to a higher um, siltation rate. And so that leads to the expansion, actually, of the mangroves in this area. Um, and, and that's what you're seeing right here. So um, the Esplanade, which is a walkway and entertainment um, a, a public space um, along the coastline, uh, uh, goes in you know, very early on, late 1800s, and it continues as the primary interface. So there's very little direct um, ability to contact the water here in the core of downtown uh, Cairns. So there's the, the wharf in front of us, the harbor facility straight in front of us, um, where you can get in and boat launches and all that kind of good stuff. But for the most of this big area, um, not much is going on. Other big things that come along in terms of the, the immediate coastal uh, uh, setting here, um, World War I drains a lot of the folks, uh, a lot of uh, this thing we're looking at, um, actually not this thing, uh, where am I looking, it's not here, but a little bit farther down there is a World War I memorial to folks that um, passed away, a uh, very high percentage. World War I makes uh, Cairns, which is already a isolated town, even much more isolated, and so that really induces the spirit of we need to to take care of ourselves because we're not getting help in the form of food and other things from elsewhere, um, or not getting much, I should say. Um, 
and this uh, leads to, uh, in the wake of, and then again in World War II, there's a large American base here, and right off of here, this, this, this region is also known as the Coral Sea. There was the Battle of the Coral Sea between uh, U.S. and Japanese forces. It was the first um, battle waged primarily by aircraft carriers, so it was primarily an, an air battle. Um, uh, so lots of military presence here, World War II, uh, lots of development, um, et cetera. In the wake of World War II, and dredging is paused during World War II. So then in the wake of World War II, 1950 or so, um, the, the dredging uh, resumes. And so we get, we get again, that siltation um, rate is increasing and deposition rate on the shoreline is increasing. Um, we then uh, move into uh, the 60s and the 60s start to, uh, uh, there's some um, works published uh, celebrating the Aboriginal culture that really draws new attention to uh, the area and starts to lead to more tourists. It becomes sort of a hippie place. Some parts of this area become sort of a hippie place in the, in the late 60s and this leads to growing tourism. Um, and that leads to more and more investment and more and more transformation of the coastal strand that we're seeing before us. And so, um, so the airport uh, over there to the far left, you can see the airport goes in. Um, uh, in the, uh, well, I guess there was an airport, but, but the commercial airport um, uh, restarts in the late 80s, early 90s, or is rebirthed uh, as a major international airport. We have uh, the, the skyscrapers you're looking at here in the, in the shoreline, those going in the 80s, um, and so on and so forth. So we see a lot more um, intense uh, development. Um, this setting is really interesting and is, is, a, is a great example of some, many of the management challenges that we face um, when we talk about uh, uh, our coast and the coastline. And so Cairns is a really interesting study in all this, uh, all these challenges.